Hello, my wonderful besties. My name is Kay, and welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to be talking all things Death Parade, and specifically through the themes of memory. And yes, nerds, you will be eating today because we're going to be looking at it through a sociological perspective. Don't come for me. I know memory is tied to our psyches. However, I try to rid as many memories of my intro to psych course I took a few semesters ago as possible. I haven't touched on a sign-in anime yet, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to take a drift for fun. Spoilers will be abundant, so tread carefully. Death Parade is a sign-in psychological thriller anime directed by Yuzuru Tachikawa. It follows different pairs of people who died at the same time as they enter the mysterious quindescent bar. The pairs don't remember when or how they got there, but as they spend more time at the bar, their memories slowly start to resurface. These memories come back in the form of children's games, from dark target practice, twister, to an arcade combat game, all serving the purpose to show the complexities of the human mind in adverse situations. The main arbiter, Decim, Decim, you idiot, oh my god, and I think I say Decim for the entire video, I am so sorry, is a slightly domineering man that acts as a puppet master and as a neutral party in the course of action throughout the games. He's calm, collected, yet assertive when it comes to diving into the darkness of his target's hearts. He isn't malevolent, but rather the embodiment of objectivity in the show. The other arbiters, Nona, Genji, and Chiyuki, all operate in different ways. Some are compassionate, others make you irritable for an entire week while forming this video because they find pleasure in impaling their subjects. Oh, wait, but we haven't gotten there yet. The approaches to memory operate on a more sociological level than psychological. You initially see flashbacks of the characters, but as the stories deepen, we vividly see their stories instead of how they think. Although this shapes their perception psychologically in the heat of the game, it subverts this by examining their stories and why they act the way they do in the games. In episode 5, we see this when one of the contestants has a memory of participating in the death game. But rather than diving into his brain, we see his expression steadily change as he is surrounded by the environment that evokes his memories. At the end of every episode, a pair is sent to an elevator to determine if they will be reincarnated or sent to the void. The framing of these stories kind of disillusions how we associate our past with feelings of happiness and nostalgia, but instead it dives into the darkest and hardest parts of our life to invoke a sense of emotion throughout ourselves. It's interesting to see this shift between the arbiters and the couples. You can see the couples are just very clueless. They have no idea what's happening. They're just entering this as if it was a normal day and negligent towards the fact that they are already dead. And once the contestants do find out they're already dead, their reactions are pretty understandable. I mean, how would you feel if someone just told you that you are already dead and made you play a game and invoke all these memories and then you're just like why am i feeling all this nostalgia however <laughs> intentional or not i feel that associating children's games with deadly outcomes makes for a slightly unsettling environment it subverts our thinking of these children's games which are associated with youth and happiness and turns itself into the most dark dreary place to essentially showcase the memories of the contestants I feel that they use the framework of the children's games to make it a little bit of an easier viewing experience so that way your focus is more towards the contestants rather than the actual concept of the games. That is a short and sweet summary of the show. However, for this video, I want to dive into how the characters and arbiters behaviors contribute to the themes of memory and how it can possibly be a blessing but also a curse.
Firstly, I want to briefly address how Death Parade distincts nature versus nurture. In the pilot episode, it is revealed immediately that the bar is the stomping grounds for the Arbiters to help coerce people's memories, whether that impacts them negatively or positively. Okay, just so we're clear, because I didn't preface this before, nature in this instance is referring to the character's personality and their identity, not necessarily something genetic or familial. However, nurture is essentially showcasing their environment in the quindescent bar and how their thoughts essentially correlate with their actions throughout the games. Richard A. Lipa highlights in his book, Gender, Nature, and Nurture, that women in their experimental studies often report being tender-minded in comparison to men. This is because one, our patriarchal society dictates that men cannot be sensitive or emotional without being completely crucified. And two, we usually associate men with traits of ambition, power, and aggression. I do want to note that I primarily interpret Lippa's studies as more indirect than direct because it would be completely oversimplistic to say that women or any other person for that matter doesn't express aggression because everyone expresses emotion in different ways. Lippa basically describes the single type of aggression that women have, (sighs) single in quotation marks, please note this, refers to the term relational aggression as a means to hurt others by ostracizing them from social groups, gossiping, and spreading malicious rumors about them. This also has some major roots in sexism that women are always catty, they're always gossiping, and they can't do anything else because they're girls. We need to launch a full federal investigation into why and how this happened. Who allowed this? Another insidious trope that I kind of find here is that a lot of these characters are very gendered. You can tell that a lot of the women are purposely depicted as the femme fatale and usually are showcasing their feminine wiles to their typically male counterparts. And that is the center of their darkness surrounding their heart and their memories. These gendered norms of how we view ourselves pretty much reflects the couples pretty well. Like I stated earlier, Desim is very calm, but he's also very assertive, which aligns with his level of maturity and how Arbiters are supposed to be emotionless and completely transparent in determining the fate of the couples. Jinji, however, reflects the direct approach to man's ambition. In episode 5, he mentions how Desim cares too much about people's minds and that he should remain passive in the system. じゃあここで何やってんだそいつは。最低のお手伝いです。人間ごときに正気か人間だぞ。私は生を全うした人間を尊敬しています。Nona also similarly identifies with this and often corrects Desim for his actions. Genji dives more into nature. He doesn't particularly care for the people he is trying to help reorganize their thoughts. He simply loves tormenting humans and exploring how they respond to problems in regaining their memories. Genji does end up growing on me. I feel that he completely encapsulates Nana's definition of an arbiter, which basically aligns with the Victorian women as more submissive and apparently... can lie about the virtue. Good for her. Ew. Another disturbing example of this is in the pilot episode, which I'll go into detail a little later, where a couple plays a game of darts and physically feels pain from the darts hitting a certain part of their body. The theme of the show is pretty abstract, but it's showcased in kind of a beautiful way. I read in a BDT article that the implicit concept of Death Parade wants to convey the centrality of human position. Till the very end, a human being has the choice within its reach. In other words, the claim of humans' free will. Since life is unfair itself, everyone can save themselves as a human being. This concept is applied by the Eastern view of reincarnation, but also Christianity admits redemption and forgiveness. 
Samuel Rosenberg of the Michigan Daily explores how digital media has transformed how we as a society view expressing our sadness. A recent study conducted by the University of Pennsylvania suggests that social media use, particularly on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, increases levels of depression and loneliness. University of Michigan doctoral student Susanna Chanduk adds, The psychological distance that exists online can facilitate being more open and making saying things you wouldn't want to say face to face. But then at the same time, it can also facilitate more confrontation because there's more distance and people aren't picking up on verbal cues as much as you would be with nonverbal cues. We live in a time, especially with the Tumblr girl comeback, where romanticizing sadness has become aspirational rather than wanting to seek help or therapy. Majiko and Takashi's relationship pushes the boundaries of how we see grief. The episode starts with both of them arriving at the Quindesim bar, with Desim asking them to play a game of darts. At first, the couple plays cool and goes along with the Arbiter's commands. Takashi throws the first dart and it lands on Machiko's shoulder, which the dart links to the character's bodies. Think of Hidan's ability from Naruto, for reference. <laughs> Machiko feels intense pain and Takashi initially is surprised. However, when it happens a second time, the couple becomes warier as if the dart's inaccuracy is showing their relationship steadily dwindling. Once the couple starts to aim away from the dart, the flashbacks of their life before death come flooding back. The couples start fighting amongst each other and are reduced to cogs of a machine. Things start to get a little interesting. As we see in Takashi's flashbacks, when Takashi actually heard from Majiko's friends that she is potentially having an affair with another man, which makes him question the entire process of their marriage or even if he wants to go through it. But he wanted to kind of turn a blind eye to this and wants to be able to have a life with her. Oh yes, we love a damaged male love interest. Even though vocabulary used in this episode refers to games, Machiko wants to be the winner and only brings up positive experiences with her husband. She is constantly in denial and at some points she makes us feel that Takashi is seemingly going insane. There is a lot of discourse in the fandom regarding their relationship since Takashi didn't communicate his concerns about Majiko cheating on him. However, if we take Majiko's perspective of her feeling uneasy about marrying Takashi because of having her one night affair, this could have already been the descent of their relationship. It's not surprising then that a lot of people who watch the show took Takashi's side in this instance. I remain kind of impartial to this. I think overall, they both just had a lot of miscommunication issues. The show implies in episode two that Machiko might have cheated on Takashi more than once. However, Chiyuki explains that Machiko regrets having that affair and wanted to erase it from her memory so that it wouldn't affect her marriage. Given the circumstances of both of them being very private people, you can essentially say that their relationship was going to be self-destructing. There is a scene in the flashback nearing the end of the episode where Machiko is constantly on her phone, which further details how she could have been potentially still in that relationship with that man she had an affair with. So given that context, I think that Majiko could have actually been the villain in this instance. This ultimately would have resulted in Majiko falling into despair and eventually their relationship would have just been cut off entirely. In this Wall Street Journal article, Sue Shellen Barger highlights how about 20% of adults claim to be chronic procrastinators. The writers use something called mood repair, which is basically when you turn sadness and depression into happiness. The happiness in this case is relief. As Majiko wants to make sure that Takashi wouldn't feel bad about himself for killing their baby. Because when he threw the dart, he hit Majiko's stomach, which I can't even imagine the amount of mental turmoil that he must have went through. Like, 
Takashi was going through it. <laughs> Overall, their relationship showed the darkest endeavors of trying to have a romantic relationship and highlight how sadness can be repackaged into rage, resentment, or just flat out anger. Lastly, we're in the stage of nostalgia, which is portrayed in most, if not all, the couples. In the game, Death Arcade has a simple layout. Fight against your opponent in an artificial battle arena. The character's thoughts throughout the game are shown in headaches, and we see the flashbacks of their past and why they did their actions. Yusuke and Misaki's strategy is to not have a plan. At first, we see each of them is fighting amongst each other, and it seems like the game is evenly matched. After Yusuke won his first match, things get a little... Sexy. Long story short, Misaki is just a victim of being womanized by several men. However, she was the one that was participating in the romantic advances, so we can't put all the blame on the men for the result of her having multiple children, but rather she had to do so in order to support herself. Her struggles are evident when she constantly breaks down, as her goal in life was just to be a loving mother. Yusuke, we find out, is a product of divorce, and all also wish he had more time and influence over his parents. There is a wide spectrum of emotions here. However, the big one that I personally see is regret. According to this New York Times article, Why We Romanticize the Past, we reconstruct what happened in the past on the basis of little bits and pieces of memory. We're acting like archaeologists, picking up the pieces and putting them back together. In Tracing Our Past Thoughts, Charlotte Lieberman says that we are more likely to get rid of negative emotions than positive emotions, which is exemplified in Misaki specifically. Harada's storyline also dove into how he wanted to please his girlfriend and his glamorous life of becoming a star is not as amazing as it initially seems. We see in Mayu being this obsessive fangirl reflects the images of the positive nostalgia associated with celebrities and stars. Just consider all the child stars that have been abused by the Hollywood machine, and nostalgia could be something that they want to avoid. This is represented by the term ruminating, which involves negative thought patterns that are immersive or repetitive. Many people slip into rumination when they are trying to process their emotions, but they become stuck in negative patterns of replaying past hurts without moving towards solutions or feelings of resolution. Nostalgia often represents positive experiences that we look back on. However, it is important to view in the context of the anime that nostalgia is used as a negative trait. The storytelling of the show encompasses the theme of the arbiters representing a parental figure for the pairs entering the games. The Arbiters are guides and a safe space to vent their frustrations on the complexities surrounding their lives, which Death Parade thoroughly executes the discussion of memories associated with humanity. It's been interesting diving into the complexities and intricacies that Death Parade represents. And yes, I know, Death Parade and Death Note are correlated. However, I felt like it was kind of more important to touch on the memory aspect of how we perceive death and how we perceive our mistakes. And I just think Death Note wouldn't have really worked here. No offense. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is all I have for today. Let me know down in the comments below what you guys think of Death Parade. I'm really curious. I really enjoyed the show. Thanks again for just sticking around, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Until next time, bye bye <laughs>